This podcast is going to look at Cuba in the early 20th century, the time during which it could be called the Platte Republic. Uh, politicians in Washington, they were very interested in Cuba at this time. The U.S. had just gone to war with Spain, in theory to help Cuba. Uh, however, the reality was uh, quite a bit different. This relationship where they were supposed to be good friends uh, turned out to be one in which the U.S. almost came to just replace Spain. Uh, for example, you can look at this cartoon that appeared in U.S. newspapers. Uh, one that was similar to cartoons that appeared elsewhere. It just showed the Cubans in a totally inferior position to the United States. Uh, the first leader of Cuba ended up being General Leonard Wood, uh, essentially a military man who ruled the island for about three years. Meanwhile, politicians in the U.S., uh, for example, Orville Platt, were writing Cuba's future. The Platt Amendment, as it would come to be called, uh, would be attached to Cuba's constitution. In fact, attaching that to the constitution was the only way to get U.S. forces out of Cuba. So let's look at the eight points very quickly. Cuba could only have treaties with the U.S. The fact that Cuba's capital building is a 75% replica of that of the U.S. is a perfect example of this uh, bilateral political relationship. Also, no public debt with anyone except the U.S. for Cuba. Clearly, this puts Cuba um, kind of at the mercy of U.S. banks. The U.S. can intervene in Cuba whenever it wants, and in fact, they did intervene several times between 1902 and 1934. The next one, the fourth point, all U.S. acts are valid uh, during these interventions. Essentially, anything the U.S. did was okay. The fifth, Cuban sanitation must be improved, and this was really perhaps the most arrogant of all of them. It was focused on yellow fever, and the fact of the matter was is that the Cubans had actually discovered the causes for yellow fever, where the U.S. was kind of left still scratching its head. Carlos J. Finley, of course, was the one who made this discovery. Next, uh, number six, the Isle of Pines is actually not part of Cuba. Uh, the U.S. kind of let that one uh, hang, yet to be determined was the idea there. Uh, later, of course, it would be Cuba's, but for the time being, the U.S. said, hold off. Next, Cuba must give lands to the U.S. for naval bases. And, of course, we know the legacy of this is Guantanamo Bay. Um, the U.S. had wanted five. They were limited to one. And the next one, this is permanent. In essence, the Platt Amendment was intended to last forever, 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 forever. But the Platt Amendment did not last forever. It lasted until 1934, though. And the relationship that the U.S. maintained with Cuba during this period, it really reflects the Platt Amendment. The U.S. essentially dominated Cuba. Um, Cuba was a junior partner um, at best. The first president for Cuba during this time was Tomas Estrada Palma. And again, he was kind of ineffectual at best here. Um, he almost had no chance of succeeding. There were so many things uh, working against him. Debts, the U.S. presence there, um, conflicting forces within Cuba. And today he's remembered as this next uh, memorial indicates, uh, which shows his statue was torn down. Uh, he's remembered as a guy who didn't do much for Cuba. So, the next several presidents um, would live in the presidential palace, which today is the Museum of the Revolution, and were all dominated, um, or all really kind of stood for just this U.S. domination of Cuba. The culmination of this being uh, President Machado, who would come to power in the 20s. And Machado, he was uh, a U.S. partner, uh, without a doubt, helping U.S. business to grow in Cuba. Eventually, he would push too far. Um, Cubans would rise up against him. Sumner Wells, the U.S. ambassador to Cuba, would step in and choose a new president. Um, Carlos Manuel de Cespedes Jr., but that didn't last. And from there, soon enough, enters Batista. Batista. 